patrol out from one of the team sites in a village, small village up in the mountains, and they were requesting a Kazavak for one of the locals. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them, and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd, and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. We weren't out there to take country, we were out there to take country. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where you know you're going to funerals quite often. Do I lead under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to screw up. War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. It should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, but what can you do for your country? The volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. I'm Sharon Maskeldare. And you're listening to Life on the Line. In today's episode, we meet Sean Wilson, who served in the Australian Army as a helicopter pilot for 17 years, including deployments to Bougainville and Banda Arche. In today's episodes, he's going to share with us his reflections on service and community. Sean, thank you very much for joining us on Life on the Line. Thanks, Sharon. It's uh, lovely to be here. Thanks for uh, having me. So tell us a bit about where you grew up, because we're recording this here in South Australia, and you come from a small town just north of Adelaide. Yes, that's uh, right. I was born uh, in a small town called Port Pirie. It's about 220 kilometres north of uh, Adelaide. So I lived there till I was about five, but uh, funnily enough, I still consider myself as being from Port Pirie originally. Dad was a firefighter and got transferred to Adelaide, so that's why we made the move uh, to here. And tell us a bit about Port Pirie, because it's actually known for being quite an industrial town, isn't it? It is. It's, uh, it's got the, uh, the lead smelter there, which uh, is probably the, uh, the main feature of the, of the town. Both my grandfathers worked at the, uh, the smelter and one of my uncles works there as, uh, as well as only recently retired. So yeah, just a, a typical small town, um, Australian small town. Everyone knows everybody. Everybody loves going to the football and everyone seems to play football up there. So yeah, just, just a very typical town that you'd find in Australia. So growing up, what were your associations of the army or the military? Did you grow up wanting to be part of that culture? We've got a very strong military background in our family. So grandfather was in World War II, two uncles, uh, both served in Vietnam, one in the Navy, one in the Army. Dad was a Nasho, so he did uh, two years in the Army uh, as a tanky on the Centurion tanks. I've got a cousin that's still serving in the Navy today after 33 years. Uh, another cousin who served in Afghanistan with Second 14 as a, uh, a lab driver. That's on dad's side. Then on uh, mum's side, we've got um, an uncle who was in the Air Force and then uh, his eldest son was also in the Air Force. So quite a strong military background in the family. But funnily enough, well, that's not what influenced me to join the, uh, the Defence Force. I, I knew they'd been in the forces, but that wasn't really a driving factor for me as, uh, as I grew older. So where did that come from, that desire to be part of, of the ADF? Originally, when I was young, I wanted to be a firefighter, like Dad. You know, most most kids grow up wanting to be what their what their father is. So, and I was certainly no different. Used to like getting dressed up as a firefighter. So, everyone probably remembers Book Week, where you have to go dressed up as a, a certain character. So, yeah, I'd ask Dad if I could borrow his uh, firefighter's coat and helmet, and he would uh, oblige me and and let me take it to school. I must say though that uh, at that stage, firefighters used to still have a, a leather belt with a little combination tool on one side and a, a small axe on the other. And uh, Dad refused to let me take the uh, the axe to school, and I was very upset about that. That as a five or six year old, I couldn't be uh, trusted at school with an axe. So uh, that's what I initially wanted to be was following in his footsteps. And then as I grew, grew older, a child of the eighties. As most people remember, there was some uh, some TV shows, and it's it's quite embarrassing to say it now, but shows like The A Team and Magnum PI had a helicopter pilots who were some pretty cool characters in those shows, and then uh, then of course there was Airwolf, the uh, the coolest helicopter that uh, I'd ever seen, and it's probably the same to this day. That really inf- influenced me, and that's uh, where I got that real drive to want to fly helicopters. The defining moment, though, was when I read the book Chicken Hawk by Robert Mason. I read that when I was about 13 years old. That was purely by accident because Dad had bought it as a gift, bought the book as a gift for for his father for his birthday, and I saw it sitting on the bench and read it, and that was it. I was hooked. That's, That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to fly helicopters, I wanted to fly Hueys, and I wanted to fly in the Army. That was it. So tell us a bit about what was it then that you imagined it would be? to be a helicopter pilot. What were the thoughts and and images that were going through your head at that time as a young man? It just seemed really exciting. It just seemed really cool. (laughs) And I I 
I'll probably use that word a lot, but it, it, it was just really cool. It, uh, it looked like a great way to, uh, to spend, your, uh, spend your time. And that book, referring back to Chicken Hawk, it was just full of stories of heroism and I guess the um, dramatised version of, of war. And, and we all know now, and you know, as we get older, we realise what the reality of that is. That book, whilst it was uh, certainly you know, mentioned some of the horrors of war, it wasn't painting a rosy picture. It was, it was the excitement and the pulling troops out under fire and, and saving people's lives and so on. That, that was what caught me. And I know there were probably hundreds of uh, pilots that joined the army in the uh, 80s and 90s that were the same and read that book. And it was almost like the Bible to us when we were in the army. Yeah. So how old were you when you then made that first step to go down the recruiting office or, or how did that come about that you then signed up? Some friends might find out some stuff about me that uh, they don't know when I say this. But I actually joined the Air Force cadets when I was 13. Um, that, that was the first step. People might ask why I joined the Air Force cadets. But at that stage, when I was 13, the Air Force still operated the helicopters, so that was 1988, and they didn't get transferred to the Army until 89. So um, joined the Air Force cadets, and even though the um, aircraft got transferred, the helicopters got transferred to the Army, I, I remained with the with the Air Force cadets and had a great time. I must admit, you know, looking back now, we used to give up our Friday nights to put a uniform on and march around and go out to the base and on our school holidays and do camps and so forth, but, but it was great. And the first time I ever flew in a Huey was as an Air Force cadet out here at RAF Base Edinburgh. And I remember that day as clearly as if it was yesterday. I remember the experience and just, we were waiting at the aircraft and the pilots came strutting across the tarmac as pilots do. And again, I just thought they were the coolest you know, coolest people on earth. And we, they put us in this aircraft and took us for a fly and they probably only took us for a circuit around the airfield, but to a 13 or 14 year old kid, it was just the best. We thought it was great. And yeah, and again, that just cemented, yes, this is, this is what I want to do. Take us back to that moment then as a young teenager, the first time you set foot inside a helicopter, what did it feel like? It was awesome. There's, there's no other word I can use. So they strapped us in and you know, we're all sitting there, you know, 13, 14 year old kids and they hadn't started up yet. So we, we didn't get in the aircraft while it was turning and burning, as we say, it was uh, shut down. We're sitting there, we see um, you know, the two pilots come strutting across and they get started up and there was a load master in the back um, and he was showing us how to use a seatbelt and making jokes, telling us if we were going to be sick to make sure we were sick down the front of our jumpers and, you know, don't spew because it'll go over him and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, we took off and we start flying around and they had the doors back, which was just crazy. We're like, you know, are we going to fall out here? I mean, we're, we're strapped in, obviously, but it's just amazing. The, the wind's rushing through your hair. Everyone's grinning. We look like Cheshire cats, these, all these kids in the back of this aircraft. And then when they came in to land, instead of just coming into a hover and then landing like they normally do. They did what's called a, a run on landing, which is essentially a procedure that you use if you have an emergency, certain types of emergency, rather than bringing the aircraft to the hover, you do a run on landing, similar to a plane, but uh, a lot slower because the skids aren't as forgiving as the uh, wheels on a plane. So when they came in to land, they did this run on landing, which at the time I just, I was blown away. I thought, this is, this is crazy. How good is this? And then you know, seven, eight odd years later, I'm learning to do them myself. I'm like, oh, that's, they're not that big a deal. But that day it was brilliant. Yeah, amazing. So to begin with then, your first foray with the Australian Defence Force was Air Force. So tell us about that. As I went along, I wanted to join the Army and, and was pretty keen to be a helicopter pilot. But somewhere along the line, I, I lost my way and actually applied for the RAF. Apologies to all the RAFies listening out there. Um, I've got some good mates in the Air Force. Uh, so yeah, in year 12, I applied for the Air Force. But that, was, that didn't really work out so well. I wasn't very successful because they, um, they told me that I hadn't scored well enough on the coordination test to be a pilot. So and they said, thanks very much, but uh, on your way. They did say I could be a navigator, but I declined their, uh, their kind offer. And I just find it ironic that the Air Force said I was too uncoordinated to be a pilot. But um, the Army, when I eventually applied for them, said, come on board, we'll, we'll have you. And I ended up flying helicopters. So what's funny is my wife says I'm very uncoordinated. She reckons I trip over when I'm out running, and which I do. So she's right. But uh, apparently my coordination was good enough for the Army and, uh, and helicopter training. Because the process of getting into fly helicopters for the Australian Army, it's rigorous. Take us through that. I mean, what do you actually have to do in terms of hoops you have to jump through to be able to pass the test? I actually applied twice. Uh, the first time I was unsuccessful, that was fine. I was still quite young. I, I was at uni. I was doing a civil aviation degree where you do your degree, but then you're also doing your fixed wing commercial license. So that, that was my backup plan. Uh, and I still remember the very first day of uni, the um, chief flying instructor came in and, and told us all, he said, look, if, if there's anyone in this room who's not here to fly, who doesn't want to end up flying airliners, you're doing the wrong course. And I was sitting there thinking, that's the last thing I'm going to end up doing, but I'm not going to say anything. So I'm sitting there very quietly nodding, going, mm, yes, okay. Because it was, it was the backup plan in case I didn't get in the Defence Force. 
So I applied while I was doing the course, didn't get in the uh, the first time and then applied and was successful the uh, the second time. And I actually got told I was or received the acceptance letter on the last day of university. So literally the last day I was going in that afternoon to finish my last assignment and the letter arrived in the mail saying, yep, you've been accepted. For about two seconds, I thought, do I really want to go in and finish this assignment? And then I decided that wasn't really the smartest move not to do that. So I went in, finished the assignment, finished uni. And then um, I actually had to wait a while. It was, I wasn't going in until September the following year. So I just did some, um, actually worked in a factory bottling methylated spirits for, uh, for a while. And then uh, also worked for Uni of SA as a data entry um, operator. So once you got in, what was the reaction of your family and friends? I mean, were people supportive? Were they gunning for you? They were. It had been a fairly long process, the, the recruitment process, and it's changed now because I actually went in as a what they call a specialist service officer, which is essentially you're recruited to fly. I believe the scheme doesn't exist anymore. And um, if you'll just indulge me for a second, I'll explain what that scheme was. When the helicopters got transferred from the RAF to the Army, there was a shortage of pilots because it was a heap of aircraft but no one to fly them so the army brought in this specialist service officer scheme so that they could fill the backlog of pilots and it was get people in give them a quick uh, we used to call it a knife fork and spoon course at Duntroon we were there for about five minutes quickly get them trained get them onto pilots course get them trained on it on the uh, aircraft they're going to fly get them into the squadron use them for four or five years and then spit them out wait and they were thinking by that stage they would have uh, made up the shortfall with general service officers which are your done through and for graduate career, career officers essentially and the sso scheme would then be shut down in reality the sso scheme stayed alive for oh, 25 maybe 30 years i can't remember the exact figures i might be over quoting it there but certainly a long a lot longer than what was anticipated by the defense force and when you got in, you talk about the, the knife, fork and spoon course at Duntroon. But what about actually getting your hands on the tools? What about actually learning how to fly um, the aircraft? How did that come about? So we went to Duntroon, as I said, we were there for, I think, all up we were there for about 11 weeks, our course. We did the, when I say the knife, fork and spoon course, I probably should explain it. Um, it's basically where they teach you where to, how to wear a uniform, you know, basic weapon handling on the style, how to eat properly in the officer's mess. Then for the pilots... We stayed on for another four weeks and they quickly tried to teach us some um, platoon level and company level tactics, just very broad brush introduction to that. What was interesting was there were eight of us on that course who were pilots. I think five of us from memory were ex-Army Reserve. So we actually had a little bit more knowledge than what somebody coming straight in off the uh, off the street would have when it came to what we were being taught. So we weren't completely starting from, from scratch. The other part with that course is it's not just pilots that do that course. There's also direct entry officers such as legal officers, medical officers and so forth. So they were doing the first six weeks with us as well. And then once that six weeks was done, they left, went back to their units and the pilots stayed, did that extra four weeks special introductory tactics module, I think it was called. Then we went on to Tamworth which was the, um, when it was time to actually get involved with the flying side of the house. Again, it's changed a lot now. I'm, I'm well out of the game and I'm not exactly sure what the training continuum is now. But for us, it was six months at Tamworth, which is uh, which was fixed wing on the CT-4. So a training aircraft that the Defence Forces used for a long time. And that was where you got taught your basic fixed wing handling, navigation, instrument flying and, and so forth. The reason they send you to Tamworth first is because that's that's where they can assess if you're able to assimilate information quickly enough. Are you able to learn how to navigate? Are you able to learn how to fly on instruments? And it's a lot cheaper in that aircraft than what it's going to be in a, a rotary wing. Or if you look at the um, the Air Force, the old Air Force pipeline, again, it's a lot cheaper in the CT-4, which is a piston engine aircraft. It doesn't burn a lot of fuel versus going straight into a PC-9, for example. So that, that was the, the rationale behind that initial flying in fixed wing for six months. And then if you were successful for that we all got uh, which most of our course got through we actually had quite a high pass rate on to Canberra where you started helicopter course at Canberra and when we got to Canberra myself and four of the other trainees got told there's not enough room for you on the course so you're going to be ground crew for the next six months until the next course starts and they said and we'll, we'll give you a, uh, an hour each week of flying and it was in the squirrel helicopter it was the, that was the training aircraft at the time so we went okay no worries so we essentially become ground handlers for for six months but then something happened that worked very nicely in our favor and what it was it probably wasn't as good for the defense force but they actually had an issue with um, the squirrel it was a training incident while our course was there and all training on the squirrel got stopped so rather than then keep our course there and start backlogging courses our entire course got sent to Oki and they said half of you will do your basic helicopter course on the Kiowa, so the 
basically a Bell Jet Ranger equivalent. And the other half, you will do your basic course on Hueys. And all I'd ever wanted to fly was Huey. That I was the only person when we started pilot's course that wanted to fly the Huey. About half wanted to fly Kiowa because they wanted to eventually end up on Tiger. And the other half wanted to go Blackhawk. But I was Huey, so that's all I wanted to fly. So I was feeling pretty confident that if I managed to get through training, then I would probably get onto Huey's. So we got sent up to Oki. And so, yeah, I was in the very fortunate position to have trained on Hueys and did all my training through from there. So I learned to fly a helicopter on a Huey, which is a, uh, the Air Force used to do it. That's, that's how the Air Force uh, did their training in the, the 60s and 70s and 80s until the squirrel was introduced into service. But it was a rarity um, in Army aviation at the time. So yeah, very, very fortunate to, uh, to do that. What was it then about the Huey which had such an attraction for you? Why the Huey? It's the sound. <laughs> that's the sound. That's it. It's awesome. Like it just everyone knows what a Huey sounds like. It's the sound of those blades, and it's, it was more than that. It wasn't just the sound, but it was. Um, it's an iconic aircraft, iconic from the Vietnam War, and just the history, and it was just the whole feel of the thing. It was. It's not the most capable aircraft. It wasn't the most capable aircraft in our inventory by any any means. But it was, it was just the. It was just the history behind the thing and the, the noise. And um, again, it was a it was a pilot's aircraft. I mean, so was the Kiowa. The Kiowa didn't have any flash systems either, so that was very much a hands and feet aircraft. I, say a hands and feet aircraft that's what the Huey was you had to fly it and yeah and I mean you know silly stuff we used to do so we'd be sitting in the crew room at Oki watching the Hueys take off you'd be watching your course mate take off and we had a it's actually a cassette player because it was 1990 uh, was it 98 by this stage so a, a bit embarrassing we had a cassette player not a CD player in the training room and it looked out over the airfield and a Huey would be taken off and someone would put Fortunate Son on by Credence Clearwater Revival and have that playing watching it was just you know we were just mucking around and being silly but yeah, it was it was brilliant. And the other thing is the instructors that we had, again, we were really lucky because we had these instructors who were just rock stars. To us, they were just rock stars. Um, there's one uh, one person, and I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning his name, but Warren Duff, who was just an absolute legend. Uh, Nine Squadron Vietnam had something like 10,000 hours on Hueys, I think. And again, I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning his name, but he was, he was just a rock star to us because he'd been there and done it. Other instructors that we had, one had flown in the Falklands with the British Navy. We had an ex-British Army had been in the first Gulf War. So these were the instructors that we had. And, and not only were they great instructors, they were also good, like just really good people. Like they, were, they weren't the typical gruff, angry flying instructor that you think about with the Defence Force. They were really just good people and they were good fun to fly with and they, and they just taught us so much about how to operate these aircraft. Another guy was there who was a, well, we actually had civilian instructors. So um, Warren, for example, was employed, I think it was Helitech was the company at the time. So a civilian employed instructors as well. And there was another um, guy, Pete, he was, uh, he'd been an SAS troop commander in Vietnam and had then become a pilot. He was one of our instructors. And so you're out doing tactical flying and, and practicing patrol insertions. And, he, and he's actually sitting there telling you, about experiences that he had as a as a soldier getting dropped in out of these things and it was it was amazing yeah it was it was really really cool good uh, good times now you had to complete your training and then you had the opportunity to deploy so talk us through the lead up to that first deployment that you had and how it came about. There were five of us going onto Huey. We'd, we'd been told that we'd been streamlined on course, so five went onto Hueys, and uh, and I was, of course, one of them. We'd been asked what we wanted. Our troop commander, flying troop commander, had uh, pulled us in and said, right, come in and tell me what type you want to fly with. You want to go into Blackhawk or you want to stay on the Huey? And I knocked on his door, opened it, and he just looked at me and said, well, you can get out. I know what you want. So I didn't even have to tell him. So there were five of us that ended up on um, on Hueys. And a few, it was only maybe two months before we graduated, the troop commanders from 171 Squadron, which is where we were going, and literally the, they were at Oki as well, so same base as the um, Army Aviation Training Centre, came across to meet us. And then they said to myself and, and my mate, you guys are deploying. So five weeks after you get to the squadron, you're deploying, which was just amazing. So the, the squadron had gone into Bougainville in April and it was probably maybe July, August around this stage. So the squadron had already been there for a few months while, while we were still on pilot's course. So we knew what was going on. We knew there was something happening. What you have to remember is that this was before Timor, Iraq, Afghanistan. This was after a period where, with the exception of um, Somalia, Rwanda and uh, Cambodia and places like that, there hadn't really been a, a long-term deployment for the ADF for, for a number of years. And this deployment was going to be something that went on for years and years. To be told you were going to deploy on operations, even though it was non-warlike, I will stress that, it was a non-warlike operation, it was a peace monitoring operation. But to be told you're going to deploy was fantastic. We were just amazed that that was going to happen. 
we finished off pilot's course and we graduated in October of 98. So I think it was the 2nd of October 98. I had to look up our graduation um, menu from the officer's mess the other night. Uh, yeah, so 2nd of October was the date on that. So that must have been the date we graduated. And I flew my first operational mission in Bougainville on the 6th of November of, of that year. So yeah, essentially five weeks later. Tell us about that first operational mission then. I mean, what were the sights, the sounds? What was Bougainville like? We were part of what was known as the Peace Monitoring Group. And essentially, people may remember there had been some trouble between the PNGDF or the PNG government and Bougainville and the Bougain Revolutionary Army. Prior to the Peace Monitoring Group, there'd been what was known as the Truce Monitoring Group. And the aviation support for the Truce Monitoring Group had been provided by three squadron from Royal New Zealand Air Force. So they had um, their Hueys over there. It then transitioned into the Peace Monitoring Group. The role of the Peace Monitoring Group was essentially to, to monitor the ceasefire that was, had occurred and um, spread the word about you know, what was happening and, and keeping both parties informed and making sure that there wasn't any fighting breaking out again. It's funny because we did pre-deployment training before we left. We flew down to Sydney to Ranwick Barracks and did our pre-deployment training and they were going through all the political considerations and the history. And I remember just sitting there and just zoning out because I was just going to fly. I was just going to fly Huey. So, you know, tell me where you need something to take and, and I'll just go. So I didn't at the time really probably give it the, the due consideration of why exactly we're there in the background. But that, that was the overarching thing. We were there because of the, uh, the truce. So deployed in, great troop commander, I've got to say, I'm not going to mention his name because he's got a big enough head as it is, but great guy, our first troop commander, so we went over with him. Great pilots as well, really experienced pilots, and so we were just co-pilots when we started, sitting there, and we just absorbed everything we could from these guys. Uh, the first mission, I can't remember, I should have checked my logbook, I can't remember exactly what the first mission was, but what I do remember is, you know, the first time you're strapping in and you're actually putting body armour on, you're strapping into an armoured seat. The Hueys back here in Australia, we just had a, a standard seat, just a normal uh, helicopter seat, but they'd put, uh, had armoured seats in them in Bougainville. So, you know, you're strapping into an armoured seat, you're putting body armour on. And again, it was a very, very low threat environment, I, I must stress that. But we, we did operate the aircraft to minimise our time in uh, what they call the, the small arms threat band. So we either flew really low or we flew up at a few thousand feet just so we're out, outside of that, uh, that small arm threat range. And the aircraft, people have probably seen the photos or may not have seen the photos, but the aircraft are actually painted orange, a bright orange colour. And that was to differentiate us from the PNGDF um, helicopters that had operated on the island previously because they were still painted up in the same colours as what our Hueys were back in Australia. So yeah, bright orange Hueys, body armour on, strap in, very different operating environment, hot, humid, had to be very careful with power, as in like how much power you had available or not. You can't just pull as much power as you like in a helicopter. There's certain limits with the engine train. It's like your car. It's basically like redlining your car. You can't redline the helicopter. If you do, then the maintainers aren't going to be very happy with you. So flying heavy, actually with troops in the back, or I should say troops, members of the peace monitoring group, flying actual missions where you're loading up the aircraft so it's at its maximum all up weight. It was, yeah, a very steep learning curve. And to put in context, we were flying probably 90, averaged out about 70 to 80 hours, sometimes up to 90 hours a month um, when we were over there. And in the first three months of that deployment, I flew 220 hours, which some people were doing 220 hours in a year back in Australia. So to do that in three months as a pilot, straight off a pilot's course, was incredible. Some of the techniques that I learned then, I still use to this day when I'm flying helicopters in my EMS role. That heavy, hot, you know, particularly in summer here in Adelaide that, uh, that can affect the performance of the aircraft. And the, yeah, the techniques that I was taught then, I, I still use to this day to, to operate. What kind of missions were you flying then? The mission that we flew most of all would have been resupply to the team site. So we were situated on the wharf at Lolaho. That's where uh, there was essentially a logistics hub. So we had four Hueys, the combined health element, which was the um, doctors, nurses, dentists, etc. Essentially all the logistics required to uh, support the operation. You then had team site in Arrow, which was uh, a little town near the wharf where the headquarters element was located. And then out spread around the island were team sites, which um, members of the peace monitoring group would live at those team sites. And then they would uh, use that as an operating base and they would go out and visit the, uh, the local villages. Sometimes they would drive, sometimes they would walk. Normally it was a, a drive at least for them. But a lot of times we would go to the team site, pick them up and actually insert them to their patrol location and then... At the end of their patrol, we'd go out and extract them. So a lot of that sort of work. The other one was resupply, food, water, whatever they needed, you know, clothes, if uh, you know someone needed some, some new cams or something like that. Uh, and the third 
big one that we did over there was CASAVAC missions, so casualty evacuation or aeromedical evacuation, both for members of the peace monitoring group and also for the locals. That must have been really important work, offering that CASAVAC service. As you can imagine, Bougainville was a very austere environment, very limited medical capability for the uh, for the local population. With the combined health element at Lolo, that provided an, an opportunity for them to receive some very good medical care considering the environment that we were operating in. It was an old wharf, there, I think it was called the Opera House, where the combined health element and the mess was. It's an old, uh, massive tin roofed shed where that was set up. We would often go out and conduct an aeromedical evacuation, bring a, a local back to the combined health element so they could um, receive some some quality medical care. And then I take my hat off to the, the medics and the, the doctors and nurses that um, operate over there because some of the work they did, it was just amazing, amazing to see. You'd, you'd bring a very, very sick person in and a few days or a few weeks later, you'd be taking them back out to the village and they'd be uh, 100%. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't always good news stories. That was part and parcel of it, unfortunately, because sometimes it was well past the point where they needed medical intervention. But again, they would they would try to do what, what they could. That was particularly the case I found with, um, we used to bring a lot of pregnant ladies in, local pregnant ladies for treatment. There was no treatment for them at all, really, in the villages. It was very basic medical uh, treatment available to them. So there was a lot of, lot of that sort of work. To give us a sense of the reality of working in those conditions, is there a particular example you can perhaps share with us of one of those missions that you flew and perhaps give us a sense of the terrain and the realities that you face as a pilot working in that environment? The operating environment in general was fairly harsh for a helicopter. Um, and what I mean by that is the environmental conditions. So this was back in the, the late 90s, so we didn't have a lot of navigation aids. We did have a very, very basic GPS, uh, like a, literally a handheld GPS, like you would use when you're out on a walking trail, stuck on the dashboard. So navigation aids were were not brilliant. Very basic forecasting services for weather. So we knew that generally the mornings would be okay, and then the afternoons you would get the storm build up like you do in the tropics, and the weather would deteriorate in the afternoons. The other thing we didn't have was ground-based navigation aids as well. So not only aircraft-based ones, ground-based ones as well. So very challenging operating environment and, and particularly the weather. The weather was probably our main threat from a flight safety point of view. Thunderstorms, heavy rain, low visibility, low cloud. To give you an example of how that impacted on our missions, the first mission I ever flew as a, an aircraft captain, which was, so it wasn't on my first tour to Bougainville, it was on a, a subsequent one. I was being um, qualified as an aircraft captain and was flying my very first mission as an aircraft captain, uh, sorry, Kazavak mission as an aircraft captain. A very good friend of mine was the co-pilot. And uh, so we took off out of Lolaho with the uh, aeromedical evacuation team on board. I can't remember, it was two or three people. It would have been a doctor, a nurse, and, and maybe a medic. What had occurred was there was a patrol out from one of the team sites in a village, small village up in the uh, in the mountains, and they were requesting a Kazavak for one of the locals. Picture that had been painted as far as the condition of the local was, it was very poor. It was fairly evident that if we didn't extract her and take her back to Lolaho, then the chances of survival were pretty minimal, if, if not zero. It was in the afternoon, so we got to the start of a river and realised that the village is up the river. And so this river snakes up into the high ground. So we start following along and we're getting slower and slower. The visibility is reducing, the clouds dropping. Imagine you're driving along the freeway. So you come out of, I'll give you an example. You're at the start of the Southeastern Freeway here in Adelaide. You're driving along and it's great. You can see everything's good. You're doing hundred kilometers an hour on the freeway. Then as you start getting up into the hills, you start seeing the cloud. Then you start hitting the fog. Then you start hitting the rain. The visibility is dropping. You start slowing down. That's what it's like, except you're, you know, 50, 100 feet in the air while this is happening. So we were slowing down, the, the cloud was dropping, mist, fog, rain, and the visibility was reducing. We're slowing down, slowing down, snaking our way up this river. And it just got to the point where we just could not continue with the, uh, with the mission. So we had to abort it. Um, we, we pushed up as far as we possibly could. And, um, and I had to make the decision as the, as the skipper to say, right, this is, no, this is not safe anymore. We, if, if we went into cloud, we would have been in a lot of trouble because you know, we had a valley on either side of us. The climb performance of the Hueys, not that good at the best of times, let alone hot, humid conditions when you're fairly heavy. So I made the decision that it wasn't safe to continue. So we flew back to Lolaho. They did ask, so the team did ask whether we could try again later on. And the, and the weather was just getting worse. It wasn't getting any better. So that really wasn't a viable option. And it was just a fairly defining moment for me as, as a pilot because the responsibility to turn back was on me. From a risk management point of view, it makes perfect sense. 
um, we could not safely continue with the mission. I was now putting an air, the aircraft and five, possibly six, depending on how many of us were on it, at risk. So the, the risk management it just didn't match up. So we had to knock it on the head. That didn't stop me when I got back, you know, laying in bed and thinking over in my head, what if we, could have we tried something else? Was there, was there some other way we could have done that? Was there something I missed? Um, and my co-pilot was great. He was very supportive as well. He was in total agreement that what we had done, and I, I say I was responsible, but, but we made the decision as a crew. That's the other thing I've got to put out. You know, I, I wasn't sitting there on my own with my co-pilot with his arms folded going, well, it's up to you, uh, Skipper. You, you do what you want. He, he was very supportive, the load master as well. So we, we made the decision as a crew, but at the end it was, it was my decision. So we went back and uh, yeah, did lay there. And years later when I was flying um, emergency medical service helicopters, I found I, I was still doing the same thing. Cause some, again, some nights the weather, and it's generally at night, it doesn't often happen during the day. You've got more options during the day, but often at night you just can't achieve a, a mission. Um, whether it's cause you legally can't carry enough fuel or the weather is just completely unsuitable for the task. Sometimes you have to say no. And it's very hard to say no. And it's something that, yeah, I'm still no better at. <laughs> I, still, I still lay there and, and think about it. Okay, is there another way we can do it? But that's, that's just me. But looking back now on that time you had in Bougainville, obviously there were tough times, tough decisions had to be made. What do you think was the legacy of you being there? I think we left it a better place, to be honest. Um, our squadron was there for three years. It was April 98 through to 2001. I'm very proud of what our squadron did. I'm, I'm proud of what we, you know, it wasn't just 171 squadron there. It was a lot of other people involved in the peace monitoring group, but I'll just keep my comments to to us. I'm, I'm very proud of what the squadron did over there. Um, I think we flew nearly 9,000 hours all up. I got that off the internet, so it might not be true, but there were thousands and thousands of hours that we flew, um, tons and hundreds of tons of cargo that we moved. When we actually left, someone had tallied up all the mission reports and had all the figures for all the number of Kazavaks we'd done, the number of people we'd moved around, cargo we'd carried, hours we'd flown, and it was pretty impressive. What I would like to do is just pause there and just make mention of the maintenance staff. So our RAMI, um, Royal Australian Electrical, Mechanical and Engineers. So the, the people that maintain, the, the guys and girls that maintained our aircraft over there, they were work like we had it easy, air crew had it easy because we'd just go flying and get away and be a little bit cooler up in the air, do our job, come back. And then, then when we got back, the maintainers had to then service the aircraft you know, end of flights or end of day servicing while we were out flying there, maintaining the other aircraft that were on the ground. So they, they were working hard. It was hot, often working out in the sun. There was no hangar there. So they were just out in the open, rain, hail, shine, literally, you know, tropical storms coming through and they're still trying to maintain these aircraft. So the, the maintainers did an awesome job and they're the, they're the unsung heroes of aviation because everyone gets excited about the aircraft and the air crew and go to an air show and no one's standing there looking for the signature of the poor bloke that's done the you know, the service on the aircraft that morning you know everyone's talking to pilots and that man but that, without the maintainers the aircraft don't fly you don't get the mission done so what they did over there was incredible and and i really do want to make mention of them because they they don't get mentioned enough our serviceability rate over there was really really good from what i remember i, I can't remember us having a lot of aircraft on the ground, unserviceable. Hats off to them. And also to you know, refuelers and ops staff as well. They, they're the other ones, you know, the refuelers did a great job. We actually had Kiwi refuelers, three squadron Royal New Zealand Air Force refuelers, and then our ops staff as well, who were sitting in there on the radios, tracking us uh, every half an hour, we'd call up and let them know where we were and that we were all good. And they, they were watching us. And if we didn't, if we missed one of those calls, they were straight away on the radio trying to find out where we were, making sure we were all right. So yeah, it's, it's just a, a big team effort um, as aviation often is, but yeah, often they've, uh, they've forgotten about. So glad I've had the opportunity to, uh, to mention them. Now you deployed in and out of Bougainville several times, but then your next major deployment was with the Boxing Day tsunami and the aftermath on Bandar Aceh. Just talk us through what your memories are of that time. I anticipate, like many of us, you would have seen that initial news come through. And did you instantly have the sense that you may be playing a key role? Straight away. The reason I knew we would probably be involved was because the, the Iroquois capability was, it was a very easily deployed capability. And what I mean by that is all we had, to, it was very easy to break the aircraft down to make it air transportable. So for example, the, um, when the Tampa crisis happened off of Christmas Island, I didn't actually deploy on that, but I was in the squadron at the time. And I remember coming into work that morning and there was a Herc sitting there on the tarmac and there was a Huey getting pushed into it to deploy to Christmas Island. So 
very easy to deploy and rapidly deployable. So there'd been numerous occasions in the past when Hueys had been moved around quickly for disaster relief operations. So I knew there was a fairly good chance. And I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but I always liked using helicopters to do a job. Flying's great fun, but it's not as much fun as when you're actually doing something. Like I was never a big fan of training flights. I mean, there's a lot of them in the Defence Force. That's just part and parcel. But for me, actually using the aircraft is is what's cool. You know, that's that's the good stuff. So as soon as this happened, I was on the phone back to Oki saying, right, what's happening? And there were, and I wasn't the only one. Everyone was ringing around trying to find out what was happening. Pretty quickly got an idea that our squadron would be involved with the disaster relief um, operation. We actually did two rotations and I was on the second rotation. So our first first rotation went in. I can't remember. I might have, I wasn't recalled from leave, but I might have rebooked a flight and gone home back up to Oki so that I was there. But um, yeah, I didn't officially get recalled from leave, but we sent in a um, three aircraft, essentially a troop in quite early uh, a few days after after the disaster so they did about three weeks there and again they were operating in some very harsh conditions for their initial deployment the waters had only really just receded from the airfield where they were operating so it was just soaked muddy really horrible conditions for them to be uh, to be working in you know they were lucky they weren't, hadn't been subjected to the actual tsunami so i don't want to um, little the impact of the local population because obviously they they had it far far worse than what our guys did but the initial deployment was operating in some some fairly harsh operating conditions. So by the time we went in, which I think it was about three weeks after the tsunami, our rotation went in, there was uh, a little bit more infrastructure, some duck boards and, and so forth. So at least you could get to the aircraft without getting your boots covered in mud, and which pilots are well known for trying to keep their feet clean and, and so on. We went into an environment that's a little bit more set up for operations. It, it was interesting though, because where we were set up was right next to a rice paddy on the airfield. And so there was a fence and on the other side of the fence was the rice paddy and then we were on the other side. Of it. And I was standing there one day and a Huey took off and flew over this rice paddy and somebody had Jimi Hendrix playing on a CD player. And there's the guy pouring the fuel into the cut-off 44-gallon drum to burn the waste from the toilets. And I'm just like, this could be 40 years ago. <laughs> like it was just, it was like a... A Vietnam scene with this Huey flying over a rice paddy, burning the 44 gallon drum, and Jimi Hendrix playing the back. It was just this surreal moment. I know it sounds silly, but it was just, yeah, just this little instant in time. Where you go, wow, it could be 1966 or something. So, but um, yeah, I don't want to make light of what we were there to do. So, there were two locations that we would operate to. So, out of Bandar Ache Airport, we would fly to a loading area on the airport, land, load, and it was like a conveyor belt of aircraft. And, and again, for a pilot who loves helicopters for me it was it was like an air show because there were it was just an international effort over there in Arche. so there was japanese black hawks japanese chinooks u.s navy seahawks all these aircraft some of which i'd never seen up close before i'd seen most of the aircraft but not operated by these different countries and you know the opportunity we didn't get a, a big opportunity to talk to the air crew because we, we were busy we were just loading up and, and we'd go we wouldn't shut down it would be a hot load and then off you'd go and there were two villages that we would mainly fly to. We'd land, offload the supplies, and then normally we'd bring back displaced persons, either people that were displaced or people who had been there looking for family members, and we would then take them back to Arche on the return leg. The first flight was, it was amazing because, and I mean amazing in, a, in an awestruck way, not in a, a good way from what we saw, because what I'd seen on the TV was exactly what we were seeing. It looked like someone had got a giant hedge trimmer and just walked around that island where the wave had stopped and it was trees from, it was just like this perfect line, trees, and then below that, it had just all been washed away. And it was exactly what we'd seen on TV. It was a, incredible how accurate the, uh, the the coverage had been on the news. So um, yeah, seeing that. And then there was a huge container ship. I still remember it. And in fact, I flipped through some photos yesterday to jog my memory a bit. Um, and we got some photos, this huge container ship on its side at a, at a wharf. and. It's like, how did that thing get flipped over like that? And just just nothing, just everything just washed away. It was just pat, just like clear paddocks of, of dirt where there were houses and villages. And you fly over the actual town itself of Bandar Arche and there's boats in there on their side. And it's, it was just, uh, yeah, it was amazing. What The force, the force of nature, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It was incredible what this wave had done. So yes, yeah, so we were up and down the coast. The conditions, again, the weather was a little bit of a challenge, but it was all coastal flying. So it was, wasn't was too challenging from an actual aircraft handling um, point of view. The main thing was just what I was acutely aware of was trying to relax the passengers 
because we were loading people into our aircraft that had no idea who we were. We're sitting in the front, dark visors down, camouflage uniforms. They've never been in a helicopter before. They've been subject to this huge trauma. And now we're putting them in our aircraft and climbing up to a few thousand feet and flying them back. I was very aware of trying to, as much as I could, make them comfortable. Uh, and particularly the kids. And the kids were great because you'd land in these areas and kids would be looking and they'd be all waving and you'd stick your thumb out and give them the thumbs up and all these kids give you the thumbs up back and you know you give them the heavy metal you know the devil horn sort of symbol and they'd do that back and or you'd wave and they whatever you did they'd do back it was like a little game that we did every time and again i know it sounds silly but it's just those little things to try and engage with these kids and oh, we were still running we, we hadn't shut down we'd still be turning and burning so um, that's why it was just hand signals that we were doing with these kids and then again with the ones in the back yeah you'd look around there'd be three four-year-old kids sitting on mum's lap Poor kids would be terrified, and mum as well, because they're they're just as scared as the kids are. So it'd be you know put the you put your dark visor up, try and make some eye contact, give them a smile, give them a wave, give them a thumbs up. You know, it's okay, it's all good, sort of thing, and, and they would respond to that. And it's only a little thing, but that's what we were. And, and I say we again, our crew, we were quite aware of that and just trying to keep them calm. And the load masters did a great job because they were sitting in the back with them of just keeping them calm and and trying to let them know, yeah, it's okay, we, we've got you. So, yeah, so we did about nine days of that. In fact, sorry, just stepping back, the first, we talked about the first mission. It was, it was quite a whirlwind getting in there because we, so we went from Amberley to Darwin one day on the Herc. Next day we went Darwin to Butterworth and we actually thought we were going to overnight in Butterworth and then push into um, Arche the next day. And we got there and they grabbed me, the troop commander, um, sorry, I was the squadron QFI, so they grabbed me as the squadron QFI, or fly, sorry, qualified flying instructor for the squadron, uh, the troop commander, and I think the detachment commander said, you're going in tonight because you're flying first thing in the morning to start the handover process. So we waited around, eventually we flew to Medan, waited there for a few hours, so by now it's probably midnight, because getting into Arche wasn't a simple process. You couldn't just rock up whenever you wanted to in a, in a herc because there was so much air traffic. They had very specific timing slots where you could get there to the point where they said, okay, we're gonna start up now and go take you to Arche. Um, they started up and we're sitting there, sitting there, probably, oh, I can't remember, it was a long time, maybe 45 minutes, and then the Herc shuts down. And we're like, oh, okay, they must have a problem. And the loadmaster came down and said, we missed the slot. So we've got to wait another hour. Yeah, okay, we've got a slot now. Started up and flew in. So I think we actually got there at three o'clock in the morning or something like that. Went to bed, sleep, and then we were up and flying a mission at nine o'clock the next morning with with the crew that were there to get the handover done and, and start things rolling. So yeah, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Looking back on that now, you must have a real sense of, of having truly made a difference on that operation. I think we did. And I joined the army to fly in combat. Like that was always what sort of I thought joining the army was all about. You know, most people that joined the defence, well, you joined to deploy and you, you generally joined to deploy, you know, to a, a, in a warlike operation. And certainly that's sort of what my mental picture was. And um, even when I left, I, I never got to do that. And when I left, I was a bit like, oh, I don't really feel like I've been tested. You know, that, that was when I left the fence, I felt like, oh, I haven't really been tested. Like I've flown in some arduous conditions, but I've never really been tested in that. Yeah, that's always what I thought I'd join the army to do. But now I look back and you look at what we did in Bougainville, you look at what we did in Arche and you saw it. And to me, I sort of go, okay, well, maybe that's what I was supposed to do. That, that's, that's what I was there to do. Same as when I started flying emergency medical service. That's what I'm here to do. Use the aircraft to help people like that. And the very last flight we did in Arche before, so we, we did a, a final flight and then we did a, um, went around to actually flew the aircraft back to Medan and that's where we load them on the Herx. Then we went back to Butterworth. Our very last flight before we moved the aircraft to Medan was a, essentially a, a PR flight in that we took all three aircraft. Normally we only flew two aircraft at a time. We didn't fly all three because one was generally a spare. Took all three aircraft and did a load them up. I think we I think we actually load them up with a lot of gifts, money for the kids, toys and so on, but you know, all, all other bits and pieces. Flew out to one of these sites where we'd been landing at. It'd all been organized and we landed and as we landed, shut down. And then there were just hundreds of the locals, kids. That's right, they'd taken them soccer balls and sort of stuff. We're there kicking the soccer ball around with these kids. And there was just them showing their gratitude. And it was, I've got some awesome photos. We basically got mobbed. I climbed up on the roof of the Huey because we were just getting mobbed. So I've got all these photos and they're all taken from the roof of the, the Huey of all these kids smiling and playing soccer. And it was only yesterday I realized when I was flicking through these photos, there's one there that's, it's a great photo, but it's also a little bit sad in a way because it's, um, again, it was taken from the roof and there's, there's one of our Hueys and you can see all these people around it. But behind the Huey is a Sea King. Australian Sea King coming into land. And I looked at it and that's Shark Zero Two, which was the one um, unfortunately crashed 
a few months later on this. Um, I don't know if it was the same crew that were flying it or, or not, but when I re reflected, I thought I, I actually remember them. They were the, essentially the camera ship for this final flight that we were doing because there was a lot of um, airborne footage of us flying out and landing and so forth. So it's a good photo in the, from an aviation point of view, but it's also a bit of a reminder of sort of what happened a few months later. And um, I didn't personally know anyone on that aircraft. I'd met a few of them, but I didn't personally uh, know them. But yeah, it was just a little bit of a reminder of, I guess, the price some people pay for doing this job. Now today, you're out of the Defence Force. You work in emergency medical services as a helicopter pilot, and you're also a firefighter. For our listeners out there who perhaps are fascinated by that transition that you've made into the civilian world, what is it you think that you've still brought with you from your time in the ADF that still informs the way that you operate and live your life today? And so I ended up getting out of the Defence Force about uh, 2013. I was separated from that. Moved into emergency medical services flying, which was very fulfilling. I was doing a lot of training when I finished up with the Defence Force. We were trying to bring the MRH90 into service. And so a lot of training flights and it just wasn't really providing me the, the stimulus that, that I was after. So I made the decision to separate, uh, moved to Adelaide and went into uh, emergency medical service, which very fulfilling. And I, I sort of went, I hear a lot of people say that when they leave the Defence Force, they, they lose their identity and they lose their sense of purpose. And I guess what's interesting is that I had the exact opposite. I had the exact opposite where I came here and I felt fulfilled. I was doing a job that was worthwhile. And, and every time, I, nearly every time we went flying, it was to do a job and, and to help somebody. And the personal satisfaction you get out of that, it's quite selfish, really. But the personal satisfaction I got out of that was huge. I like being part of something, and I know it's cliche, but it's true. I like being part of something that's bigger than me. The Defence Force was like that. It's, it's always bigger. It's not about you. It's about everyone else. It's about the team. EMS, Emergency Medical Service Flying, um, which is what I did when I first transitioned out of defence, that it's the same thing. It's not about you. It's about the person on the ground that you're going to, um, going to assist. Involved with that was also some law enforcement flying and I actually quite enjoyed that because again, and particularly when some of the flying you do is in, you're essentially in direct support of people on the ground. And again, it's not about you. It's about you providing something for them on the ground. The fires are the same. It, it is, I often get asked about how I ended up from flying in the army to then, you know, then flying for Babcock in emergency medical services and then ending up as a full-time fiery. And again, the fires is the same. It's, there's a little bit more to it, which I'll go to in a second. But again, the fire is, it's not about you. It's about the team and the core team in the fire is, is a, is a fire crew of four people on a truck. You're only as strong as each other. You know, you're, you're a team and you look after each other. But yeah, going back to my childhood, you know, I mentioned at the start about dad being a firefighter and um, when I was little, I wanted to be a firefighter until I watched those silly 80s TV shows and then got interested in flying. Yeah, mum and dad sort of died quite young. Uh, mum died from cancer when I was 14 and dad actually died when I was 15, about a year later, um, coming home from uh, work, actually. And I never realised at the time just the influence that he had on me. And, and the influence of him being a fire, I remember what it had on me. So as I was progressing through my career, just every now and then I'd get this little you know, itch on my shoulder about being a fire, and most of the time I ignored it. But it then eventually got to the point, even though I loved doing the full-time work with Babcock and there was an itch there that needed to be scratched and you know, I spoke to my wife about it, my, my source of wise counsel, the same person I had asked about, what did she think about me coming on this podcast? And she basically said, yeah, go for it, like, just have a crack. And I figured, yeah, I don't want to be 60 years old and go, oh, gee, I wish I'd had to go out the fiery. So yeah, so I applied for the fireys and was successful and, and got in. And again, it's yeah, quite a quite a fulfilling, fulfilling job. And it's nice because I they're getting few and far between now. But when I joined, there was quite a number of people still around that had worked with dad and you know, tell you a few stories about him and that that you, you weren't aware of. So so that was pretty cool to have have that um, that connection. Yeah, so that's that's how I've ended up doing what I'm doing. And as we uh, spoke about earlier, fortunately, I was given a, a casual contract with um, Babcock, so I still get to fly emergency services, helicopters. Um, I do a lot of the check and training, uh, flight examiner, uh, flight instructor role with them, but I still get on the line and actually fly the, the missions as well, which is, um, yeah, fantastic. Sean Wilson, firefighter, pilot, thank you very much for joining us on Life on the Line and sharing your experiences of your service. Thanks very much, uh, Sharon. And uh, yeah, thanks again for having me. It was an absolute privilege. Thank you. I'm Sharon muskell -Dare, and you've been listening to Life on the Line. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram and Facebook at Life on the Line Podcast, on Twitter at L-O-T-L Pod and on LinkedIn at Thistle Productions.
and find out more about this show and the team behind us at www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget. <laughs>